We moved into the bar area where we carried on drinking and it got out of control pretty fast. I remember drinking a lot of shooters and disappearing in between intervals to go use uh, more and more and more drugs. From there, it, it pretty much got very blurry conversation and things. I don't really remember a lot of it. All I remember was um, at one interval, I wanted to go use again in the toilet. Now, the reason why I, th I know that I was in that toilet is because I remember sitting down using first. I remember specifically sitting in the female toilet. I remember that moment of entering the female toilet and I remember closing the cubicle door and I remember using my drugs and I even had my beer glass with me in the toilet. It's difficult to describe for me what happened at that moment. It's very sensitive to me and it's something that breaks me every day. I have to live with every day. It's something I can't take back. <laughs> everyone welcome to or welcome back to our channel and thank you for joining us here again today so last week we spoke about a case that involved south africa's most wanted man at a point and if you haven't seen that i will link it up here for you but today we are not going to talk about a murder but we are still going to talk about a disgusting disturbing and horrendous crime it is a crime that offended and shook south africa to its core and before we get into today's case, I do just want to give a general warning that this video does contain disturbing content or videos, so please just be mindful when watching this video. But with that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. So before we get into the horrific crime and the horrific incident that did happen, let's just start with a little bit of a backstory. And the reason I wanted to talk about this case today is because I was in the mall over the weekend and I was obviously heading for the food court and I noticed a restaurant up in the top corner and I thought maybe the restaurant had closed down because of this incident. And yes, okay, the incident didn't happen in Cape Town, but I don't know why I thought that they closed down, but that's what sparked my interest to relook up this case again. Chantal Nanal has three boys and her first son was born in 1997 and his name is Nicholas Nanal. Nicholas Nanal was born in Pretoria to a young mother who was only 15 years old at the time and Chantal had a very rocky relationship with Nicholas's father and the relationship didn't last too long after Chantal found out that she was pregnant with Nicholas and Nicholas's father wanted nothing to do with him and he was never part of his life. As soon as Nicholas was born, Chantal suffered from postpartum depression and Chantal was quite absent through most of Nicholas's younger years. And soon after Nicholas was born, she started taking heavy drugs and started drinking a lot of alcohol. Later on, when Nicholas was around two or three years old, Chantal did meet another man and soon after the two met, they dated and then they quickly moved in together. Chantal did not end up staying with this boyfriend for very long and it was said that she had three boyfriends and was in and out of their homes by the time Nicholas was four years old. And it was alleged, sadly, that one of these boyfriends did physically and sexually harm Nicholas. And I'm not sure if it occurred with the same boyfriend who did the physical and sexual harming. However, at one point, Nicholas had been thrown so hard into a cupboard that he still has the scar today on his head. Nicholas's grandmother really noticed the physical harm that Nicholas was going through, and she determined that it would be 100% safer for him to be with her than his mother and these boyfriends. However, you can't just take a child away from their mother. So Nicholas's grandmother did try and take it all the legal route, and she did take him to quite a few doctors, to quite a few psychologists. And remember, Nicholas is still only four years old at the time. So he was being poked and prodded and being asked all these questions by psychologists. And I think it was just a lot for the young boy. And his grandmother would often say that he would go through traumatic episodes at her house, that he would often beat things. He would hit his hand into the wall until it bled. And this was all at four years old. But eventually doctors did determine as well as the state determined that Nicholas would be obviously safer with his grandmother than the boyfriend and Chantal. So now that Nicholas was in the care of his grandmother, she said that he was excelling throughout the years and during his school years. He was a lot more social, he was participating in sports and he was enjoying them. He did well at school, he played rugby, he played cricket, he did gymnastics, he played first team cricket and rugby. He he did well at school, he was liked at school, he was, he was a good boy. And his behaviour was also improving. However, the rule was that even though Nicholas was staying with his grandmother, he would still have to visit his mom every weekend. And his grandmother noticed that every time he would come home over the weekend, he would have these aggressive spells every time he came back. 
But Nicholas's grandmother just tried to do the best that she could and she tried to give him all the love and comfort that she could when he was with her during the weeks. And in 2009, when Nicholas was around 13 years old, he was just about to go to high school and sadly he got into the wrong crowd. Nicholas was friends with a group of older boys and he was then introduced to smoking weed and drinking alcohol heavily. It was also reported that during this period, he did have his first sexual encounter consensually, apparently. And in 2010, Nicholas, as usual, was still going between his mom and his grandmother. But on one night, particularly in 2010, Nicholas was set to go to his mom's house for the weekend. And when Nicholas got there, he unpacked his bags, he was chilling in his bedroom. And then some of his friends said that they wanted to come over to the house just to hang out. So Nicholas is like, sure, come over, that's no problem. And when Nicholas's friends got there, his mom was heavily intoxicated and she then started passing alcohol out to everybody in the room. And everybody got drunk that night. Then at one point, Chantal actually noticed that Nicholas was very intoxicated. And Chantal thought that the best solution to sober him up was to give him some heavy drinks. So Nicholas then proceeded to follow his mother into her bedroom, where she then took out a little baggie and she put lines on her dressing table. She then proceeded to instruct Nicholas how to take the heavy drugs. Nicholas would go on later to testify that the dynamic between him and his mom was more like a sister relationship than one of a parental relationship, and he never felt any sense of authority from his mother in their relationship at all, and that their bond was purely brother and sister kind of thing. The first time I used, if you consider one as a drug, was I was about 12. Um, the first time I consumed it was with a bunch of older friends. But my first encounter with chemicals was with my mother. Um, I was 13 years old and my grand let me see my mom on weekends. She was young when she gave birth to me, so she was always like the older sister to me. She's now 37. Um, at the time she gave birth to me, she was 15. Um, so I would say we more had like a brother and a sister relationship. And so from this point on, when his mother took him into her bedroom to give him this line of heavy drugs, this is the point where Nicholas started to spiral and he went through a phase of taking heavy drugs all the time. When Nicholas was 17, he was still heavily drinking and he was still into taking drugs. But he also then met the person who he believed to be the love of his life and they went on to be in a relationship and she did end up falling pregnant, but she decided not to keep the baby and this really broke Nicholas's heart. And soon after she then terminated the pregnancy, they then broke up. Nicholas was incredibly depressed about this, and it was at this point that he tried to then end his own life. Luckily, Nicholas was found in time, and he was taken out of the bathtub and rushed to hospital. Now remember, Nicholas is still not of age yet. He's not 18 yet, so he is still under the care of his grandmother. And his grandmother is constantly stressed about how she is witnessing the decline of her grandchild. She first tried to put blame on Nicholas's behavioral changes based on stress and his constant shifting between his mother, but she couldn't deny that there was something else. And eventually she did take him to the doctor for more and more psychiatric testing, and they did deem him to have bipolar disorder. Nicholas was then placed on medication that he would need to take for the rest of his life. Later on, after Nicholas had been taking his medication for a few months, he did admit to his grandmother that it was probably partly the bipolar disorder that was affecting his mood and his personality, but he did confess to his grandmother that he was still taking drugs and he was still drinking a lot of alcohol and once he confessed to this his grandmother was having none of it she then took him to a rehabilitation facility where he then stayed for eight months once nicholas was out of rehab he was like a completely different person he was sweet gentle clean and sober and things were really looking up for him when nicholas is honest he is not the child that i raised he is not the boy that i raised him to be when Nicholas is on drugs, he becomes delusional, he becomes aggressive, he sometimes becomes quite manic, um, he cannot, he, he doesn't reason properly, um, he's just, he's not himself, he looks different, he, he speaks differently, he behaves differently. Just after Nicholas had finished his rehabilitation stay, he did meet another lady who quite soon after would now become his fiance. And he was now 19, just about to turn 20 years old. Then in 2018, just three weeks prior to the incident at Dross, Nicholas stopped taking his medication completely because he felt that the medication was slowing him down. But the real reason that he stopped taking it was that he was now 
heavily back on alcohol and drugs. And Nicholas proceeded to smoke and drink alcohol every single day up to the point of the horrific incident. So the day prior to the incident at Dross, Nicholas went to work as usual, but he did end up leaving work earlier that day because there were rumors that he got into an altercation with his boss, but most of the sources said that he just wasn't feeling well. And the reason that he wasn't feeling well is because he hadn't had a fix the night before, so he was now going through withdrawal. So Nicholas now left his work around lunchtime and he went onto the streets looking for a fix. Nicholas then ended up finding a dealer, but he unfortunately used every single last cent of their money for the rest of the month. But now that he was high, he then ended up going back to his now pregnant fiance, and she was not impressed at all because she could see that he was high as a kite. The couple then continued to argue late into the night, but everyone went to bed and the next morning came and Nicholas got up for work like usual and he then headed off to work early hours of the morning. My fiance told me I should go to work. I dressed up for work and everything. I was planning on going, in all honesty, to go and fix things. But I was coming down and I didn't really feel in a good position to go and speak to my manager. I was very depressed and I was very um, upset with myself. So therefore, instead of going to work, I went straight to Silverton, where I picked up drugs again from my dealer. On Nicholas's way to his work, he felt that he needed another fix but he had no money. Remember, he just spent it the day before getting another hit. So now he needed another one. And the problem was now that he needed to find a dealer that would give him something on credit. Eventually, Nicholas got what he was looking for and he now had his drugs. So eventually, Nicholas got everything that he was looking for and he smoked a little bit, but then after he was done, he decided, actually, he's not gonna go to work. What he's gonna do is he's gonna find a restaurant He's going to drink as much alcohol as he wants. He's going to eat as much as he wants. And then when it comes time to pay, he's just going to get up and walk out because he has no money. So he's just going to leave. That was all Nicholas's plan. So Nicholas headed to Dross Restaurant in Pretoria and he sat outside because it was quite a hot day. But while he sat outside, he had clear view of the children's play area. And this is important for later. But before Nicholas started ordering all of his food and drink, he decided that he's going to go back to the bathroom and take another hit. And this is what he would do throughout the time that he was sitting at his table drinking and eating. He would constantly get up and go back to the bathroom to take another hit. Now, at the same time that Nicholas was sitting outside enjoying his food and drink, a mother and her young daughter were seated at the Dross restaurant because they just wanted to have a nice afternoon lunch. The young girl that was with her mother then noticed that there was a play area and she begged her mom, please can we go play in the play area? And her mom was like, sure, no problem. So she took her child's hand and they then went to the play area where you had to sign your child in, give their name to the childminder so that the childminder knew exactly which child was which. Just for some context, this girl was six turning seven at the time. So her mother then signed her child in and everything looked a-okay. So the mother then leaves, the childminder then gets up and locks all the children in the play area so that they are all safe inside. The mother then goes to sit at her table where she has clear view of the play area where her daughter is in. And during the time that the mother was eating at the restaurant, she would sit down and she would look up every now and then to see what her child was up to but then this young girl inevitably needs the toilet and according to the rules of the play area in Dross the child minder would need to accompany the child to the toilet and then escort him or her back to the play area but on this day the young girl asked the child minder can I please use the toilet and she said yes she unlocks the door she then points to the toilet that the child must use and so she was sent off to this bathroom alone at this point that this young girl is heading off to the toilet Nicholas has had many shots, he's eaten so much, and he has also had a lot of beer to drink. And I also assume that he was highly under the influence of another kind at this point as well. So as this young girl is heading towards the toilet, Nicholas notices her and he quickly grabs her and he then puts his hand over her mouth. He then drags her into the men's bathroom and into one of the stalls where he then proceeds to have his way with her. Now, while this absolutely heinous crime is going on, the mother who was sitting at the table notices now that her child is not in the play area at all. She can't see her in any of the playrooms. She can't see her coming down the slide, nothing. So she gets up, she quickly runs to the play area. She knocks on the door, the child minder opens and she's like, where's my child? The child minder then proceeds to tell the mother that she's in the bathroom. So the mom then rushes to the toilet. She looks in every single cubicle and her daughter is nowhere to be seen. She then rushes back to the play area where the child minder is and she says, listen, my child is not there. You need to come and help me find her. Please, can someone help me? So the child minder then leaves the children in the play area. She locks the door. Her and the mother then proceed to go back to the female bathroom 
look around, there's nothing in there, and then they decide, okay, let's go to the male bathroom. Maybe she got confused between the two. So the women are now trying to open this door and nothing's budging. And as they are pushing on the door, they are hearing a young child in the bathroom screaming for her mother. Her mother has now got all of the color drained out of her face. She's running for help. She's asking every man in the restaurant to come and help her bash down this door. The waiters, all the staff come and help. They then proceed to bash down this bathroom door. And they also then bash down the cubicle door where they find an absolutely horrific sight. I will now play you the video of all the staff in the bathroom where they found Nicholas. And I do just want to give a warning that it is quite difficult to watch. And I found it difficult to watch because of the state that Nicholas was in. And I'm not sympathizing with him at all. I just find it quite a difficult pill to swallow for the young girl. Because seeing Nicholas naked in the store, you can't really fathom what this young girl had to go through. And that's just the part that I find quite difficult. What's up in here? What's this, bro? Me! I'm very excited to get shit, man! Fuck sakes! You fucked with me! You! Jeep the lock! Jeep the lock! You're not going to say anything! 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 You're not going to say there's nothing fucking wrong with me. I'm sober. I'm a mental man. I'm fucking okay. I've got a tag running at the bar. I'm sitting in dreams. You fucking naked. I'm a fucking naked. I'm a naked. They came from the other side. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Then in 2019, the Gauteng High Court found Nicholas Nanau guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison for the rape of this young girl. He was also sentenced to another five years for defeating the ends of justice and an additional five years for the possession of an illegal substance. I would say at the time I didn't really care about anything. I was high for a few days so nothing really mattered to me. Like I said, I was doing things with impulse, making decisions not really caring about consequence. I guess I was angry and in that state, I made a mistake and I intentionally went out in that moment with that encounter with that girl and I, and I intentionally did those things to her. But my regret came to me too late. My regret came to me, I realized, I knew exactly in that moment what I was doing, but I guess with my mental state, it's not that I wasn't aware of what I was doing, it was just that I was in a completely different mind state with the drugs. I couldn't think rationally. Like I said, consequence was nothing to me. It was, there was no emotion attached. There was no emotion. I was angry. I was full of hatred. While pleading guilty to the charges, the state rejected Nicholas's version that he was using drugs in the bathroom when the child walked in and asked to urinate. And during the trial, Nicholas said that he was actually in the bathroom. He didn't grab the young girl. He was already in the bathroom when he saw her walking in. And remember, every time Nicholas went to the bathroom, he was busy doing some illegal activity. So when he saw this young girl coming in, he was already high as a kite. And that was his version that she had walked into the bathroom asking to use it. And that somehow gave him justification for what he did. However, Judge Masopo, who was presiding over this case, found that Nicholas had actually stalked her, followed her into the bathroom, where he then pulled her into the male bathroom, had his way with her. And he believed that Nicholas's actions were 100% premeditated and not just by chance or impulsive, as Nicholas said it was. According to the judge, it was stated that Nicholas threatened the victim to keep quiet, and he kept his hand over her mouth as often as he could, but when Nicholas was caught out, he took her underwear and he flushed it down the toilet so that evidence was not there anymore. And recently, Nicholas Nanal was granted the right to appeal his case, and he has appealed his case, but it hasn't gone any further. And the reason that he is appealing is because he said that it wasn't premeditated, that he wants to now throw this case out because he said it was completely impulsive. So he believes that the state doesn't have a case because apparently they're basing the case only on this attack being premeditated. So like I said, in one sense, thankfully this case is not a murder. However, in an article that I read, this young girl describes that she has nightmares often about Nicholas. She says that she sees him grabbing her and that she constantly fears that she's still going to be grabbed by him. This young girl also says that she can't sit at restaurants anymore 
the noise in the restaurant and the people all around her is absolutely triggering to her. And before we end, before we cut off, I do just want to show you another video clip with regards to Nicholas's mother. And I do understand to a certain extent that a mother's love is very strong. However, Chantal's words upset me very much. And let me just play the video and I'll explain why after. I just want my family and my children to know I never ever meant to hurt any of them. I love my son. I love all three of them. My older son is not a pissed. He made a mistake. You just made a mistake. Now personally, I don't classify this type of horrendous crime a mistake. Everything that Nicholas did was not a mistake. He was conscious of the actions that he was doing the whole time. And what Nicholas did was absolutely horrific and there is no justifying that. So I'm getting a bit sweaty now, I'm getting a bit angry. But let me just end the case off on that note. That is the infamous Dross case. Let me know what you think of it down below. Please stay safe out there. Thank you again for all your support and your kindness. And I will see you again next week. Bye.